Fighters, today I have back my buddy Adam Sand. Um, you're going to want to check out this interview. He is uh, CEO, founder, all that good stuff, a roofing business partner. Uh, you can check him out at roofingbusinesspartner.com. We talk about life and kids and marketing and ideal clients and how to attract more of the right people in the trades, how to make more money. It's a great conversation. So without further ado, here is my interview with Adam Sand. Um, it turned into like, okay, don't fire me. Let me fix your CRM. And then we started doing that. And I mean, that, and that just became what we do now because it was more mm. sticky. It was more money. And then, uh, and then I had to change the entire business up when I had a baby here in November. <laughs> well, first things first, what's your baby's name? Atlas. Atlas. And yeah. how is Atlas doing? Uh, he is, you know, he's four and a bit months now and he's got his activity center the other day and he loves it and he's teething early and he feels, I feel like he's going to walk any day now, even though it shouldn't be, um, but yeah. he's just growing like, I, I don't know, maybe it's that vaccine. You know what I mean? Like we had to get it across the border into the States and now mm. I think he's just like a mutant or something. <laughs> is he's he power so lifting strong already? and he's growing already, so fast. Yeah, power lifting and all that already. That's yeah, cool. That's crazy. Where, where yeah. do you live? Uh, in between Hawaii and Canada. Okay. Yeah. So Edmonton uh, area in Alberta. Um, and then we have a place out in Hawaii and that's where we were for a long time. But then once we had the baby, um, and we went, came back to Canada to, you know, do the tour, right. For everybody to meet him, mm -hmm. when we went to cross the border back into the States, the border agency was just like, so you have an American born kid. And I was like, really? Like, yep. Yeah. Right. Cause Allison had some complications or whatever. And then, so that just immediate red flag, they put us in the back, mm -hmm. right. Where they put all the crying people. Right. And then mm -hmm. we had to go through the whole process. And they denied us to come back in. And we've been working on a different visa for about a year and a half. We put a hundred grand into it. We should have had our interview actually while we were while we were here that in that phase, that eight days, we timed coming back with our interview time. But then it was late, so we had to get back to the states because I had two conferences to attend. Mm. And then they and then they just denied us and like we have to wait for your interview. So we waited for our interview. The girl said, "Yep, yeah, I think I want to prove you today." And then they put us in administrative processing, and it is the government. It is slow. And they're like, I mean, they're just pulling the straws. Like they really kind of are, are projecting that their thought process was that I built, went and built a multi-million dollar company in the United States, hired 30 people, traveled the country, went, attended conferences, paid for booths at those conferences, paid my medical bills, hired, paid taxes. Also that three years later, I could have a baby accidentally in the States so that what he would get Obamacare, like like, wow. like, you know what I mean? It's like, and then when you're in my position and I haven't seen my dogs in two months because they're still at my house in Hawaii, I have a babysitter just hopefully giving them some care. But then I got to watch the news every day and you know what's on the news every day. Well, I was, and you're sitting here going, yeah. I'm the problem. I was going to say you screwed up. You should have gone to the, came through the Southern border. Yeah. It wouldn't have been a problem. It. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's like. I know you just, you see people yeah. I, like I see people on TikTok bragging about you know this stuff and I see you know the stuff that's happened like you know that people beating up cops and getting released and flipping off cameras and I just go I'm your problem like you have a right. screen door on a submarine and you're putting your finger over top of the hole that I'm trying to go through <laughs> and you think you're solving the problem. That might be the best analogy I've heard, man. I love it. I love it. Well, I'm sorry you're dealing with all that shit. It makes no sense. And it's uh yeah. um it's just wrong. It's flat out wrong. We all know it. And uh yeah. you know God's teaching me God's teaching me something. I don't know what it is not yet. Sure what I'm it sure it'll make sense. Something yeah. something's coming, right? Yeah. It's yeah, just uh, submit to him and it all works out. Well, dude, maybe you're just gonna create the next software to fix this shit in the government, you know, and then you'll you'll own planet Earth in a few years. So there yeah. you go. Um, no kidding. <laughs> in fact, well, I, mean, I don't, yeah, I don't think you could do it, Adam. I don't think you could create a software that would fix this problem. I just, that's how you get me going. You probably yeah. couldn't yeah. do it. You know, well, I mean, you're talented, is, is that that but, would, you know, you, the uh, problem is I'd be done in six months, but the government would want to spend $12 billion on it and make it right. three years late. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. And then I'd get dragged into a Senate hearing for how I overspent the money. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. uh it'd be your fault again. 
you'd be the yeah, problem again. It's always the private so, contractor's fault, not the bureaucracy's fault. That's right. <laughs> yeah, man. So cool hey, business, I, is, but yeah. it's it's fun going to business, right? And then this is just a part of the part of my challenge. And yeah. I mean, I I love I love America, and it's worth it's worth fighting for. There you go, right? man. It's worth fighting for the opportunity to continue to be able to live and do business in that country. Yep. I hear you. Let me uh, turn that off there. Okay, cool. I want to make sure we're good. Um, well, you get through this stuff. Like you said, you're learning something. Who knows what it is, but you'll figure it out. And you know, yeah. well, congrats on Atlas, man. Hope hope uh, you're enjoying it. It's it, we have five kids, and it's a it's a riot. So yeah, uh, a... ours are all out of the house now, but it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. So you know, it, it's kind of kind of neat. You start thinking about yourself. And, or you, <laughs> start thinking of yourself as the ghost of your kids memories like you think mm-hmm. someday he's going to remember this and it's going to anchor him to some behavior that he's going to choose to have and it creates like this whole new perspective right <laughs> yeah on like how how you behave and conduct yourself because now you're thinking this isn't just like my choices these are going to be yeah. his his template they're watching man like you mm-hmm. know if they don't know what's going on they're watching and mm-hmm. uh and they pick up everything it's pretty crazy um, yeah. So, I, so you had a, you, you were you? Did you end up doing a TV show, or did that get kind of thrown off based yeah, by we, COVID? We, yeah, COVID kind of screwed it up a bit. We did, we we filmed four episodes, uh, which they called season one. It was called Unfinished mm-hmm. Business on on uh, HDTV, and then didn't renew it. You know, they just didn't mm-hmm. get the feedback they wanted. They they were I was an experiment. They never had like a a coach. And, Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it was a little bit unique where I had a builder and a designer and I would go in, um, and coach people basically that started a master bathroom remodeling project 11 years ago and it's still not done. And so I'd Mm -hmm. go in and I'd be like, you know, Adam, what's, what's going on inside your head here, man, that you can't finish this thing. You can't see this thing through. So I'm coaching them and, Mm um, um, the feedback they got with their, you know, focus groups and stuff was I, I don't go to HGTV to get coached. I go there to escape. And so, Mm. um, and there were some things, you know, I, I'd never done a show before and I, I didn't realize like there was some, some input that I had that I didn't know I had as the host, you know, I just was kind of, I just, I was like, Hey, I'm just the hired hand here, you know, the host. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was just being me and then they edit the crap out of everything. And, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy, but I, you know, it was great experience overall. I think, um, if I could go back knowing what I know now, I think, um, I would have been a little more vocal about some things, you know, not like being an asshole, but just like, um, I think the way they set up the episodes was, was kind of jacked up. We, we should have done it differently. And, the well, um, nice thing is, is YouTube you know. people go there to get coached all the time. Yeah, and you already know how to do, how to do content media. Mm-hmm. Like we're experimenting with that ourselves. We started this thing called Building the Sandcastle because, like, our journey is so crazy. From two years traveling the country, living out of our like not living out of our car, but like going from city to city, sitting in our Yukon mm-hmm. um, with me, my wife, and my dog for two years during COVID. To you know everything we're trying to do with the business now, we started this thing called building the sandcastle because Allison was pregnant, and we just thought you know like all the content that I wish I could see, like my heroes, like the Alex Ramoses, the mm-hmm. Grant Cardone's, the Gary V's, the Tony Robbins, the you know even like go back like to like the Warren Buffetts, Bill Gates, mm-hmm. Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, right? I wish that they would just like how cool would it have been if like when Jeff Bezos was putting books and boxes on his hands and knees, right? And there's a story about how. They're all on their hands and knees in his garage, putting books in boxes. It's so busy. And then Jeff stands up and goes, stretches his back, goes, oh, guys, we need knee pads. And a guy who's now like a senior vice president worth hundreds of millions of dollars, but he was in the garage with them that day, says, no, Jeff, we need desks. (laughs) And how great would it be if you could go back and see fate like, can Jeff Bezos pull out his Facebook live? Like, so the funniest thing just happened. We were on the right, like, and then he says, right. and then this guy here says, no, Jeff, we need, we need desks. Right. <laughs> and, it, and, and the, and the crazy thing is, is once you get successful, you get haters, right. And they say you're yeah. fake and you didn't really do it. And, or, you know, like you don't pay enough income tax or like whatever. Right. Like everybody, we, we have this weird thing in America where 
everybody wants to like tear down heroes once they made it. Like it's like the minute you make it, all these people want to tear you down. It's almost like you don't want to be an exceptional person because the minute yeah. you do, they'll just tear you down. It's like yeah. who wants to be president? You know, like the great, the best and greatest would be stupid to go be president. Dude, I and, remember. Uh, go ahead. I was just gonna say, and yeah. so we decided that we wanted to make that content, even yeah. though it was financially burdensome. So we actually like started vlogging about our life and we have, you know, Allison's home birth, right? We did that, right? We have like her yelling at me in the shower because the dog <laughs> knocked over a coffee and I don't, oh, wasn't as sensitive enough to it, how we had to deal with it. We had employees quit because of the show, because we, you know, we started out talking a little bit more about like stuff we were dealing with with employees and they were comfortable with. And so the first episode caused two people to quit. Like, you know, we went through, but we're showing like what it's like to build a business when it's new. And now I get... My highest episode is 4,000 views. My lowest is 180. It has no views. But my hope is that, you know, when, if I believe in what I'm doing, right, if I believe that I'm going to get to where I want to go, right, then I owe it to the entrepreneurial community to make the content that I wish I could consume so someday mm -hmm. someone else could. Yeah. Right? And so that's that's the theory behind it. So when I hear you say what you just said, I just think, dude, like, whether you own the naming rights or not, whether you you know name it something different, like if that's what you want to do and if you believe in what you're doing there, if you believe that you can help people with that, yep, I say do it, man. Yeah, it's a um, <clears throat> you know the the other issue that we ran into. Um, so like give you an example is um, you know, everything I do in the contractor fight is stop stealing from your family, right? <laughs> it's like, mm -hmm. it's about, you know, charging more and charging appropriately. And most contractors don't make money and all this other shit. Then I'm on HGTV and we're mm. in the kitchen and the network is telling me that I need to give this budget for what this kitchen is going to cost. Mm. And, and you're kind of going against your core and, values with that. And so, <clears throat> so I, uh, I just chose to be me. And I said, um, so like one, the first time we did it, they were like, yeah, we want you to say that this kitchen's around 28 grand. It's going to be about mm -hmm. 28 grand to do this kitchen. And I'm like, I texted a buddy of mine who's a kitchen remodeler and stuff and builds kitchens and this and that. And I'm like, Hey, I'm shooting all these pictures. I'm like, how much is this kitchen? He's like, man, it's like a hundred, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, fuck. So, so on the show and they edit it in a way that not everything comes out too. You know what I mean? Like you don't, they oh, don't my do buddy it, was on like, naked and afraid twice. And okay. Yeah, well, there you go. So, you know, I've heard all about how it goes. So I said, I said, uh, what was the woman's name? Um, shit. I forget her name, but anyway, really nice lady. I said, Hey, listen, um, I've got some good news and I got some bad news. And she's like, oh. and I said, let's start with the bad news. This kitchen is a, is a hundred thousand dollar kitchen to do this, to do it right. And, and, uh, I said, you ready for the good news? She goes, what's that? I said, the good news is you already have the cabinets and <laughs> you already have, you know, some of these appliances and you've already shared with me that you have a bunch of people, including yourself, that are willing to put some sweat equity into this. And so the majority of your labor is covered. So it looks like you're going to be out of pocket around twenty eight to thirty four thousand dollars. So that's how I framed it. Mm -hmm. but, but it was still bullshit and it felt icky, you know, because yeah. it's just not. So I had to walk this line and it was um, and I was very clear when we did the um, the the interviews to see like they reached out to me for like, I don't know, several months. And they're like, we want you to host the show. And, and finally I did a zoom and I'm like, guys, I can't go on HGTV and talk about how contractors are ripping people off. Okay. Yeah. Like, most of them are fucking broke. Most of them are not yeah. making any money. Most of them don't know like their numbers and you consumers think that they're ripping you off and they're not, they're starving while you fucking retire and they never retire. And they're like this whole thing. I said, so I will do the show under one condition and how it was supposed to be was I was going to bridge the gap between unrealistic homeowner expectations and contractors mm -hmm. and show that like, cause I, you know me, I call bullshit on the contractors as much as I call them on the homeowners, right? People, you know, I just call it as I see it. And so that was the intent. I think it would have been a lot better had it been on another network 
I think it would have done mm. better because <clears throat> HGTV is a little fluffy. And so, yeah. um, and so the, 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 not, not like the fuck you in your face, Tom Reaver, but like the little bit more intense version of me would have probably been accepted better on spike because it would have been you you <laughs> yeah so right. so i've uh my team and i we you know the last year and a half two years we keep my wife and i and this that we keep throwing around the idea we know some now i know a bunch of people that produce and i could pull a team together and do it um it's really at this point just going what's what's the angle that people give a shit about for something where because it i would want to do it where why, why HGTV works here? Here's the biggest thing. They, here's the problem, create some drama. Oh my God, can we get this done? Here's the reveal, right? The mm -hmm. show is always about the reveal. And so I picture like, and just as an example, like a bar rescue for contractors, but there's no reveal and bar rescue. There's a reveal. There's a grand opening. There's people in a restaurant. You know what I'm saying? It's more visual. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I help, I just help fuckers make more money, save their marriages, you know, be there for their kids. You know, it's, there's not this big visual reveal. And, and so we're just kind of working around like, is first, what would that look like? And second, is the juice worth the squeeze? Because it's, um, as you know, you've done the YouTube thing and this and that, like, it's, it's a lot, man. You know, and, and it's, it's a ton. Yeah. And if it doesn't, fulfill... if I wasn't passionate about the project, yeah, like I don't want to film a, I'm not like for my like business content, you know, we don't spend a lot on production value, right? Like mm -hmm. we, we spend enough to be relevant and like, and be taken seriously, but like the building the sandcastle to actually create like a lifestyle type, you know, TV show quality thing that runs 11 minutes. That's like to do a weekly episode costs us like 10 to 16 K a month. Right. Like, it's like, that's a serious investment. If you're trying to get an ROI on that, like I'm not getting an ROI on that other than like I'm putting into the world what I thought, but you know, mm -hmm. kind of speak with, speak to what, what, what you said, right. Um, you, you know, you're, you're helping people spend more time with their families and help them make more money and uh, live better lives and spend more time with their kids. The, the contracting industry is really like, you know, America's forgotten sons, right? Like that's, yeah. Who ends up in in this especially now like that the youth doesn't have like a pride in the trades it's kind of like mm -hmm. where they end up you know you kind of got america's forgotten sons and the biggest thing that i've noticed was like you know prior to having the baby our business really just became like you know people in the roofing industry would tease me and say you know we're a luxury of the rich right like that because mm -hmm. we were building like you know 100 200 000 systems for large enterprise level roofing companies but it required me and my team to be there on site because you got to stare at 50 doe-eyed salespeople who are now getting their commission cut, their roles changed, the tools they're using changing, the whole business process is changing to adopt, you know, to move from some kind of, you know, base model system that's built mm -hmm. for like, you know, the 60,000 roofers that are between, you know, three and 8 million and going to like an enterprise level system. And these guys, you know, like they don't need another boat or another car. Like the marginal utility of money in their bank account has yeah. had a decreasing rate of return on their happiness for years. Like you're running a $46 million company doing 10% net profit. You got 4.6 million. You bought a building. You're investing in real estate. You're in, you know, you got a ranch. Like your wife's got all the bags. You go on vacations. Your kids are set up. Like that wasn't make, making them happy. They just wanted their business to run the way they envisioned it in their head. Cause it's kind of grow, outgrown their hands. Cause in a yeah. contracting business, you know, Walmart has 60,000 cameras inside of a 60,000 square foot store, right? And yet, yeah. as a contractor, you got a, you know, a 600 square mile store and you got no cameras, no insight, no tracking, no nothing. And then when you've got 100, 180 sales reps and, you know, stuff like this, like it's, it's too much. But then when I, when the baby was born, my wife was like, well, you're a business consultant. So consult yourself and figure out how to not travel anymore. Yeah. And so I had to spend about six months with a crayon figuring out, you know, how to turn that into a, a new business model. And we found a way to like scale our services to appropriately serve. Um, we had to use some technology enablement and nerdy stuff, but we found a way to serve three to $8 million contractors. And what I found is I hadn't talked to them in years. And what I found is like the version of me now, right. Realizes like these customers are families. Like I got a client that's you know a yeah. husband, wife, and both sons. That's who's running the roofing <clears throat> company. 
and this stands to change the family tree like mm -hmm. it's a really more rewarding place to live right in in helping these like three to eight million dollar roofers um and it, you just even to get to three to eight million you have to yeah. figure out a lot of stuff and step on a lot of landmines right mm -hmm. and you if you when you say there's the juice worth to squeeze you know there's a portion of you that at this point right you have legacy right because you mm -hmm. men typically go from making money in business to some kind of creative work mm -hmm. to legacy and changing the world right like mm -hmm. talk about trump right mm -hmm. he went from building businesses and making money to the apprentice to president yeah. and so what is your version of that like you've done a lot of creative work but then now what is the legacy you leave behind mm -hmm. so the juice might be worth the squeeze if you can find a way to tie it back to what does it mean when Todd Reaver's gone? Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. When I was trying to ultimately say, okay, how do I train other consultants to do my job? Mm -hmm. You know, it was okay. First, we have to operate on the theory of constraints, right? So if you're trying to run from point A to point B and get there as fast as you can, you can try and improve your gait, right? Your process, right? Mm -hmm. You can try and change your shoes, get better systems. But if there's a rubber band holding your ankles together, right? That's the constraint. Cut the rubber band. The shoes and the, yeah. the and the running and the breathing doesn't make sense. Like doesn't change that much. Yep. Then you have to get to a place where you can collect data, right? You have to collect data, and then mm -hmm. be very pragmatic by saying the data is telling us something. What is working? Let's do more of that, right? Yeah. And you have to think like, is it outperforming the average? You do more of that, and you do so. Like you kind of we're talking about, you could do, if you're doing direct mail, right? You mm -hmm. spend ten thousand dollars in direct mail and you get a million dollars in sales. Well, if you do twenty thousand, do you get two million next quarter? Well, great. If you did, if you spend thirty thousand, do you get three million? Oh, you only got two and a half. So you reach like that asymptote, mm -hmm. right? Decreasing return. So then you have to say, well, can I do it better? So a better offer, better targeting, better, better, you know, more colors, bigger postcard, right? You know, where where do we do it? How do we do it better? And then once you get, if you've exhausted more and you've exhausted better, then you do new and you have to do new based on the experience of everything you've done, right? To say, is this going to be easy with a big impact? Is it going to be mm -hmm. easy with a little impact? Is it going to be hard with a big impact or is it going to be hard with little impact? And you start at the top and work your way down. If you get to the point where it's hard and has very little impact, then there's probably a new constraint that you're not seeing. You should probably refocus around that. And when I showed the consultants that I was hiring that, that methodology and then just tried to like build infrastructure mm -hmm. in these businesses that allowed us to get the data so we could be pragmatic about it all of a sudden really getting anything to go wherever you want became kind of easy and predictable like it almost be, felt like a cheat code if people could just memorize that like whatever how many sentences it is yeah i probably wouldn't have a job right and, yeah and so whether I, don't, I think it applies to pretty much anything health right like marriage mm -hmm. content business sales like just constraints more better new new based on impact and then be just ridiculous about executing and, and be honest right so so what are some of the constraints that you're seeing um just at the you know higher level bird's eye view with the contractors you've been working with you know when you get your hands on them what are yeah. some of those things so you know by the way i'm starting the interview now so yeah no, no, good. <laughs> i i kind of i kind of saw that we um yeah, we, <laughs> we when i look at the when i look at these roofing companies right i saw a really good interview today where a guy's actually being used as an example right okay and for most people he is because he's running a about 46 million dollar roofing company and so somebody's doing an interview because it's a clickbaity headline he's well known so it's like here's this guy now i've worked for a lot of these people right and the very beginning of the interview, he's talking about how he has 100 reps. Now he has 180 reps. He's talking about scaling into busy season for roofing, right? And he's mm -hmm. saying that, you know, but they get into talking about how salespeople have this like natural happiness set point. That wasn't the language they used, but it's, I, it's how I was interpreting it. It's like, yeah, sometimes like salespeople is like pushing string, right? Mm -hmm. Because they get, you know, some guys get to 75,000 or 100,000, some get to 150,000, but that's really where their like belief lid pops out. And mm -hmm. that's, that's where it's like that's where they're happy making money but the problem is the company is generating leads so then you have to hire more salespeople to accomplish the leads because if he takes these 108 you know, 100 reps from last year 
He says, yeah, their average is around three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars in annual sales. And sometimes you get a million dollar producer, but they're hard to do. So we really focus on personal development, but they kind of circle the drain a bit on this conversation about the difficulty of it. And, you know, you have to motivate them and you have to try and create competition. And these are project managers. So they're doing like cradle of the grave style sales, right? So they to get the lead, they sell the job, do the work order, material order, you know, and then kind of like run the job, you know, okay. tell the subs what to do and then collect the check, right? So I call it like cradle to grave. Most people do. And then we've been big, like we've done the data because we had to figure this out during COVID, right? Which mm -hmm. was like, now you couldn't meet people in their homes. You could sell, you had to kind of sell more. You had to get more appointments out per day. And I had a client reach out to me and said, Adam, I want to do 25 million easier than I did 20. And this will explain why this came up. And so mm. he flew me out there for a month and said, I got to figure this out. And he said, I got some sales guys that can quote some roofing materials, some that can quote all. My sales manager basically has to die because he's not doing bad because we're growing, but he's not doing great. And he can't really like qualify if these sales guys really qual like quoted the right stuff because he doesn't know all the materials, but I don't want to fire him and I don't have anybody to replace him. And he said, and some sales guys are really good at follow up and they're like, you know, they're, they're not good at closing the deal and they discount before they even come out of first pencil. But, you know, they close a lot of deals and follow up when they're really good in the CRM. And they keep things organized and their deals are good. And then I got these other guys, man, they're killers. But gosh, like they, you know, they don't close that many more deals than the other guys. They just one call close a lot more. And but they're always cooking up heat. Their jobs are disorganized and there's so many leads in their bucket. And they're not taking care of it. And that's what this guy in this YouTube video says. I paid for 10,000 leads last year. We got 2,500 sales and I got contractors in my market say, oh yeah, we're happy to pick up your slack. You know what I mean? Like they're happy to be the second guy because they know they're, because, and, and so he's being modeled as the example, but then, you know, I look at the data on that. So with that customer, what we did is we drew a circle on a whiteboard and we said, okay, what are the skills that are needed to be a good, a good salesperson? It's like, well, you got climbing on roofs, taking pictures, site conditions, inspect, like finding leaks, you know, like just knowing how to kind of scope a job and then there was got to be able to kitchen knee ta a kitchen table kneecap to kneecap closing deals presenting demo you got to drive you got to be able to climb on a roof right and then you got to go uh then there's like the inside stuff which was like follow up setting up deals putting the things in the crm you know creating the company cam creating the the sumo quote like the ordering the measurements from the satellite company all that stuff that kind of stuff and then handing off the job to production like the notes to give to production and then there was like estimating, right? Mm -hmm. And then, so when we were finished, this circle kind of looked like a COVID thing. You know, so we called it the amoeba. And this was during COVID. Yeah. So I think our brains were all just thinking sure. about it. And uh, so we called it the amoeba. And so what we kind of theorized was, what if we could just split the role up, right? And have inside people and outside people and like maybe an estimator for when the jobs are complicated. And yeah. so I flew back home and then I went and built the CRM that would allow for this. And we came up with a different compensation plan where we're like, okay, Outside guys will get like 5% instead of the usual like 10 to 12. The inside guys will get 15 bucks an hour, $150 a deal, and 1% if they get over this many deals. And we experimented with like what the team should look like. And we looked at it as like one inside to two outside because every lead that comes in, the inside jobs incur about an hour of work, right? You got to lead intake, put together, you know, the notes, set the appointment, order the measurements, set up the deal in the CRM. You got to follow up, follow, follow, follow up. And then you got to like sign it. And then you got to write some notes and push it to production. And then outside incurs about two hours worth of work, right? Cause you have to drive there, do like your 20, 30 minute inspection, checklist, pictures, that kind of stuff. And then put together a proposal, walk in, do your dog and pony show, overcome objections, sign the deal, get back in your truck and start trying next one. That's about two hours of work. So we really realized it was one inside to two outside because if you get eight leads a day, the inside person accumulated an hour, eight hours worth of work. And the two outside people included uh, incurred four hours each, or sorry, eight hours each. So this would like scale and pause, right? Mm -hmm. And well, that company ended up doing 46 million that year instead of 20, right? And so when I look at that guy, he's got 180 reps, he's doing 46 million a year, he's getting 10,000 leads, close around 25%. And he's paying a high commission rate because these guys got to do all the work. And what are they thinking? I got to do all the work for this guy, right? And he's paying me 12 or whatever percent commission. But I got to do all the work. And for all that work, if I could get paid like 100 grand a year and I could work six hours a day doing all these different things, some things I'm good at, some things I'm not good at, some things I like, some things I don't, I'm good at making 100, 120 Q a year. So when he says, oh, we got more leads, who can run more appointments? He's like, man, hire somebody else. I'm good. Right. Mm. Whereas this model actually decreased the cost of sales 
And because it split the role in two, so then it split, decreased the cost of sales and split it, they kind of had to do a little more um, as far as volume to make the same money, but they were doing the things they're good at. Like one of the best inside yeah. salespeople I've ever met is actually in a wheelchair, right? And would like yeah. be doing Verizon tech support. And so then we, this is what we rolled out across the country for two years. So I look at this guy, if he split those 180 people into 63 person teams, right? Our pods typically do two point, like the average is 2.7. Our record is 7.2. The next highest is 5.7, but the average is 2.7 million per pod. You know me, I like, I love and a data, pod is right? three, right? Pod is two, pod is three. two outside and one inside just to be clear yeah. for everybody. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So there, our average is 2.7 million per pod. And so if they just did that, and there's a couple other ingredients that go into making this work, right? You got some tech and stuff like that you got to do and some processes that change. But if they just did that, the math that I put out, that would be a $146 million company. Right. Right. Yep. And so they wouldn't even have to do like, they'd probably lose. Like we had one client, 15 of their 17 sales reps quit the week after I left, they hired back eight, but they went from 1.2 million a month, 60 days later, they're doing 3 million a month and they kept doing that and the employees are happier. And so a lot of what I see at the high level is that, right. Mm -hmm. It's not looking at the data and seeing that like, to make the work your people do more rewarding and engineer a better customer experience that aligns. Like if you show me the incentives, I'll show you the outcomes. So align the incentives mm -hmm. with the outcomes you're looking for. Big companies would be a lot more efficient. And if they could, I have this thing that I say that I'm not done until roofers are respected at the bar and the bank, because yeah. these companies blow so much money to these sales guys who get paid two, three, four, five thousand $5,000 to sell, you know, 20, $30,000 project. And we're not against sales guys making money, but, then you see the whole crew gets paid $4,000 to do backbreaking work in the hot sun for 12 yeah. hours, risking their lives, right? Yeah. And missing their families and, you know, having unexpected dates when they get like those sales guys say, ah, I'm good. I'm good. You know what I mean? But the roofers, they got to get the job done, get the roof water tight. They told their wife they're going to be home for dinner, but now they're not showing up till 730. They're going home. Their wife's disappointed. Their kids don't like them. They get mm -hmm. divorced and the cancer of the contractor's family persists. And if, we could decrease the cost of sales, increase net profits with a few other operating frameworks. We could pay the tradespeople more money. Yeah. If we pay the tradespeople more money, when they walk into a bank and ask for a mortgage and they write down a roofer on their application, the bank isn't gonna go, oh, this is gonna be a waste of time, right? right? And if a roofer walks into a bar, sees a girl and she goes, wow, you're in shape. I like your chiseled jaw and your beard, right? It's like, <laughs> what do you do for work? I'm a roofer. He goes, ah, oh, shit, I'll go date the fat banker, right? Yeah. And yeah. It's like, if I can, I'm not done until I can make roofing companies run so efficiently that the roofers are respected at the bar in the bank again. Dude, I love that. And, and here's, it's funny because <clears throat> one of the other things on my list to talk about was hiring, right? Mm -hmm. And I have a belief now I'm, how old are you? Uh, 40, 40. Okay. I'm, I'm 54. Ever since I was a kid, as long as I can remember, it's been drilled into my head. You got to go to college. Don't go to the trades. The trades are a fallback. It's if you know a trade, that's good. Cause you could fall back on something. It's always a second option. Right. Mm -hmm. And so number one, I think culturally just that messaging for decades has made the trades less attractive to people. Right. And just on that macro level, However, I'm about, as you, I'm about like, all right, well, what do we have control over, right? <laughs> like, fuck the circumstances, you know? What do I have control over? What do you have control over? I And the, one of the things that drives me <clears throat> is I believe that the hiring issues in the trades, one of the things that's going to help those go away <laughs> is mm -hmm. when the average contractor is kicking, is kicking ass, when they have a good marriage, they have a good bank account, you know, they're not just broke, tired and dirty like my dad was my whole life as a tile guy coming home. You know, um, it's where the contractors are living in the gated communities, not just the customers of the contractors. When mm -hmm. contractors are going on vacation. I mean, dude, I, I never went on vacation growing up as a kid. So I spent my whole life and listen, my relatives that are in the trades and stuff, I love them to death. They work their asses off. Right. All the respect in the world. But like as a kid growing up the last thing I ever wanted to be was in, in the trades because yeah. all my buddies' dads were doctors and engineers and shit. And they were on the outside, you know, you never know what's going on. They were killing it. And so I, 
I love that mission that you have because I think it, it resonates with me because I'm sitting here going, you want to make the trade. You, you want people to come into the trades. You individually have to be attractive, right? Mm-hmm. Like it's how about instead of being the fat ass plumber with crum, plumber crack, be the guy that's on 75 hard, who's in shape and making yeah. fucking bank. You know what I mean? And has a great marriage and all these other things. Yeah, and so, a big truck and a quad and kids yeah. that he gets to play sports with. And mm-hmm. he has the body that he can still play sports right. with his kids. And it's like if there's – and there's elements to this that need to be fixed, right? And I think the responsibility is, you know, it falls on the on the employers who want to bring respect to their trade because who else is going to do it? Mm-hmm. And, like, when I had my roofing company, you know, it was Sergeant's Roofing. So what we mm-hmm. did – try and impact this right because i used to say this when i was owned a roofing company too i said i'm not done until roofers are respected at the bar in the bank and i said i, I look at my place I'm like i know like most it, it, you guys growing up doing this job if you guys manage to hold your marriages together and your kid grows up a roofer you're gonna be like man i worked my ass off my whole life your mom stayed off the pole how the hell did you end up a roofer right like that's mm-hmm. your perspective we have to change that from the from the employee we have to give we have to teach them how to take pride in themselves and so we had Sergeant's boot camp, which is where we cross train them on the different parts of the different jobs in the company. Mm-hmm. We had sergeant support, which was a huge test of me because I would I would on Sundays when I have time off, I would meet with them for an hour, hour and a half. Um, at the time, I had a condo downtown, like yeah. big fancy kind of thing, and we had the the rec areas, right? We had like the golf thing and the you know pool tables and stuff, and we would you know book it out for two hours, and I'd bring them food, and they'd tell me about their girlfriend that was a they're the girl that was a dating a hell's angel that he got pregnant but she can't tell her boyfriend that she got knocked up when she was cheating on him because he'll shoot her the <laughs> drug addictions they have the drinking problems they have the money problems they have their yep. dreams and then we do sergeant's goal setting on on the first monday of every month at 5 a.m i bring them in and we do you know work with the book the one thing by gary halpert try mm-hmm. and drive them towards a long-term goal and then we had thursday which was just the company meeting where everybody got together and i would always pay a lot of respect to the roofers to try and say look it's this sergeant's roofing it ain't sergeant sales it ain't sergeant's accounting it ain't sergeant's marketing it's sergeant's roofing and yeah. they called it roof church because i would try and take like i would take like straight up i would take patrick bet david's videos and i like, yeah he talks like 21 rules for young men like get off porn <laughs> don't watch this don't do that like remember this don't get yourself involved in that and yeah. I would straight just take, take the content, rewrite it into a notebook, and then I would go and present on it, right? Because if I put them in front of a video of some rich billionaire that's, like, talking about insurance, mm-hmm. it's a, it wasn't going to hit them the same. But they looked at me as a certain kind of way. Right. And so I would do that. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, I was in northern Canada. It's not a great market, you know. But I would encourage business owners that if you have – and the problem is it's so much subcontracting and roofing. Like, the business owner doesn't actually – Right. Have that. And I think that this new law from the IRS is going to change a bit of that because they're actually coming after contractors. If you make 90 percent of your income from one source, you're technically an employee. So I think you're going to see some disruption. They Mm -hmm. basically modeled this in California, Hawaii and Idaho and Washington Mm -hmm. state. So they're kind of rolling it out nationwide now. And this is going to change a lot of the way people have to do payroll and systems, but they're also going to have yeah. to change the level of leadership that they have because they're going to have to actually bring these guys in who drink a bottle of shampoo for breakfast and come to work. And then they're going to have to like get and they have to take Americans, America's forgotten sons and they're going to have to extend the level of leadership that they have. And I think mm-hmm. that the people who will win right in the changing world where every all the currency is digital, the government's got to pay off the covid debt. They're coming for their money. Right. They're coming for their tax base. They're letting everybody mm-hmm. in across the border like they, they want their. They know what they're going to do. There's going to be a big immigration reform and all these people we grant to temporary foreign work visas or some shit like that. And they're going to tax them and they're going to pay off all this COVID money. Right. Like they like the math tells us that this has to happen. They need to increase the number of people that are paying taxes so they don't have to campaign on raising taxes. They have to raise the number of people that are paying taxes. Mm -hmm. And so that is going to translate into more in-house crews. And I think that if someone someone with a bigger voice than me can teach <clears throat> business owners in the roofing or in construction right to teach contractors that they can and should take pride in themselves that mm-hmm. this, and find ways to make their businesses more efficient so they can make the trade more attractive we will solve the labor crisis yeah and we will make america a better place and the children of these contractors will become better fathers better husbands and better citizens mm-hmm. and America will be a better country for it. 
is 40. 32% of the national GDP is home services. That means 30% of the income is going to people who are broken homes, broken families, broken social structures, you know, they've lost, you know, I, I don't want to make this preachy, but like they don't have a relationship with God or something that gives right. them like a moral code that exists beyond the legal laws of their state. Like something that says like this, and my soul's on the line, you know, like something, something that gives them a moral code that goes beyond getting yelled at or getting your hand slapped or getting, going to jail. Like that shouldn't mm -hmm. be the only consequence. Like if you can get away with it, you're good. You should be like, someone's yeah. always watching and it matters. Yeah. I don't know. I think, man, I think it's a value we're striving for, but I'm, mm -hmm. I know I'm, I know that to a lot of people who are just trying to figure out how to get to $2 million in revenue and make 40% gross profit and 10% net. And they're just trying mm -hmm. to figure out where they can get leads. Right. I think that there also has to be a realistic perspective of yourself and say like, are you really a business owner? Like 80% I said, I have this like thing that pisses everybody off, but I say 80% of roofers don't deserve to exist. They're selling the same shit installed the same way by the same people, use the same tools in the same amount of time for more or less the same price. There's no Louis Vuitton of GAF shingles is 10 times the price. You don't have models and on skirts, you know, on the roof and stall roofs. It gives the, the, the roof Chris steak experience of asphalt shingles. Yeah. Like yeah. it's a pretty simple business. And so if you're installing a commoditized product, and you don't have anything that stands you apart as a leader, you might not necessarily deserve to like by the invisible hand of capitalism mm -hmm. to be successful because you don't have the right ingredients. But if you have a part of the business that made you want to start your own company, why did you leave? Shitty boss, right? So yep. what'd you go and become? Yep. A shitty yep. boss. Shitty boss. Maybe yep. there's just be less shitty bosses. And, and and I think that more professionalism in this industry and it's a little more a, a good economic, you know disruption right like we've had a lot of expansion for a while now i think we have a soft landing going on but if we get a real hard you know bump coming up like another 2008 you're going to see you know a lot of people found to be caught swimming naked when that tide goes out as warren buffett would say and and yeah. i think that that's going to create a rise of great leaders running great organizations and these people who are struggling aren't struggling because they're not they don't have access to you. Like you are putting out so much content. The answers are out there. Like it's, mm -hmm. it's never been easier to get the answers yeah. it's just, will you right. do it? Well, and that that's, that's hands down the thing right there. Like it's you, how many times you, you probably do see this when you consult people and stuff like you say something, they go, yeah, I know, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the curse of the, I knows. Okay. And I'm like, well, if, and I, I believe you don't really know it unless you're doing it. <laughs> like it's, it, the it, intelligence yeah, it, is not whether you know it is whether you do it right. it's like if you get this it, intelligence is same same stimulus different reaction right mm -hmm. like alex ramosi puts it really simple if i hold up a red card and i slap you and then i hold up a red card and i slap you <laughs> if on the third time i hold a red card you don't duck you have learned nothing you know i'm going to slap you but exactly. if you don't duck you have learned nothing <laughs> Yep. And this, this is true in all matters of life. Yeah. So I want to, um, <clears throat> I want to talk about, uh, I want a little bit of the marketing stuff because, mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's, there's so many things I can talk to you about. I told you that before we hit record and it's, I'm, I'm looking at this list just going, okay, what, what's going to be the most value for people here? So, um, are you are you cool if I throw a couple things at you and we just kind of rapid fire them? Hundred percent. Yeah, thoughts. I know I can I usually fun. I can usually so, yap a bit, so I'll try and do some rapid fire. Yeah. So, um, what's your thoughts on how to figure out who your ideal client is? Uh, really, trying to figure out who you're best built to serve. Right. If you, like, you figure out who you're best built to serve, what is unique about you as a company? Like if you if you're bilingual, maybe mm -hmm. targeting people who are from a different country. Right. If you are, if you focus, if you're really good at metal roofs, do that. If you're good at multi-trade, do that, right? If you're, if you're, if you're like, I have a client forever metal roofing, like they only do metal roofs, right? Mm -hmm. They look, they turn down business every day. All right. So trying to figure out who you're best built to serve will then determine your ideal customer avatar. Cause if you're just trying to say, oh, my ideal customer avatar is rich people that have big budgets and, and they want to trust the contractor on every decision they make, like, yeah, you and everybody else slick. You know, right, like, right. who are yeah. you best built to serve, right? Mm -hmm. And then, you know, then you might find your vert. If you're really smart, maybe it's commercial roofing. Like, if you can do the paperwork, if you can do the, do, like, if you can handle all the bidding and qualification and contract management, like, if you can 
at, like I know guys, that's all they do. They're a one man roofing company making 5 million a year. They're doing contract management, bidding and estimating. And they're doing four roofs a year. You know what I mean? Like hmm. maybe that's you, you know, but yeah. who are you best built to serve based on the chemical makeup of who you are? I'll try and go faster on the next one. No, that was fine. That was good. And, and cause it reminds me back, you know, with our <clears throat> painting company, um, we had a couple different ideal client personas. One happened to be the wife of a high level executive who was being transferred from the East coast to the Chicago area where we were at. Mm -hmm. And they had moving trucks on the way and they had a deadline to hit and they appreciated the fact that we had a big crew. We'd get in, we'd get out and we would make that house in a couple days, her home and never miss the deadline of the movers coming. Cause she had a bunch of other things on her plate with moving the kids, schools, finding That's really a good. sushi place and whatever. So we went after re, uh, the higher level relocation companies mm -hmm. is kind of who I would prospect. And um, we never got, never had, never were out to bid on those projects, whatever the price was, the price was cause they, at the East coast to the Midwest, the big key there was shit is always more expensive on the East coast. So we were price conditioning. We were priced quote unquote high in our area. We were always higher than every other contractor for the most part, but the people that were being relocated, <clears throat> they never thought we were expensive. So it was like easy. <laughs> um, and that, and that so, in, in turn is who are you best built to serve high touch mm -hmm. fast, right? Cause you always say cheap, mm -hmm. fast or good, right? You're fast mm -hmm. and good. Right. But you ain't cheap. Right. Mm -hmm. And you built a company around being able to serve that. You know, in my roofing company, I said we were Bob and Betty who were professionals, military or business owners. Mm. And they they had a 612 roof, about 30 bundles, suburban home. And they had teenage kids living in the home and they typically had no fence and nice landscaping. And I knew that that was my best customer because professionals, business owners and military people, we had the hero discount. But they typically look at things through a lens of liability and they yeah. didn't want to take a risk. It was like a mechanic would be like, well, my boss charges me out 140 an hour, pays me 40. If I could find the version of me, then I'll just hire that guy. But that they yeah. don't look at terms of liability. No fence, nice landscaping. When we did the data on it, what we found out is people with no fence, they live in more community with their neighbors and they want to make sure they're not the bad apple in the, in the group that mm. hires a contractor and makes a mess everywhere because they're the ones that have, and the nice landscaping means like, you know, the guys that like make the checkered pattern on the lawn, right? Like oh, these yeah. guys are like, Hey John, you're going to take care of that weed, right? Don't be mowing that dandelion. Make sure you pull that out and spray it. And so all these little, like <laughs> you, what you're talking about is yeah. these personality traits and how they align with who you are. Cause we were like militant about tarps and property mm -hmm. protection and all these kinds of things that do that. And so if you have teenage kids living in the home and pets, you know, you care about your backyard being clean. Yep. If you're living, if you're teenage kids, you're probably not moving them soon. So you're going to be the primary beneficiary of the lifetime product that you're trying to sell. So mm. you, 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 you just, we, we just gave two very good examples of exactly how you make your, who are you best built to serve and align your product and service offering around that continue trying to prove the product yeah. to those people. You brought up pets. It's funny. Our, uh, one of my buddies had a amazing remodeling company. And among other things, the number one ideal client check box that had to be checked was they had to be mm -hmm. dog owners. Um, they, they found through the years that every project that it was a dog owner, mm -hmm. the people were easier to work with. Uh, they did not, if you were a cat owner, they were like quadrupling the fucking price. Like, <laughs> cat people are a pain in the ass for the most part. This was their data. Um, but dog people were a little more easygoing and all the jobs that were dog jobs had higher gross profit on the, on the production side. That's so beautiful. I just kind of, kind of funny. As a dog they, owner, I'm proud. I'm, yeah. I'm proud, but also wanting, you know, making sure I'm checking my, checking my, my bills. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, sticking to marketing. Um, stupid marketing mistakes, things that annoy you when you open up your phone today or you see contractors driving down the road, anything that jumps out from a marketing branding perspective that just drives you crazy right now. Mistakes, stupid yeah. things, whatever. Poor targeting and poor offers, right? Free inspection, free estimate, right? Like, like that's not an offer. That's what everybody's mm -hmm. doing, right? So trying yeah. to create real value. It has to have urgency, opportunity, scarcity. Go read $100 million leads by Alex Ramosi and mm -hmm. figure it out. Um, you know, or anybody else who talks about, you know, who's reputable, but you know, poor offers, right? You, you gotta have something that makes the customer say, I w don't want to miss out on this postcard, this Facebook ad, this billboard, right? Having a good offer and then having good targeting, like targeting the wrong people, 
targeting outside of your target, like just not knowing the platforms. Like you got to know enough to be dangerous if you're going to do it yourself. And you got to manage the people who work for you because people who run ads make mistakes all the time, right? They're constantly in these platforms. And simply a wrong number on a zip code or just mm. not realizing that Louisiana is different than um, another state, like the two-letter digits, right? Like Wyoming, Wisconsin, or mm-hmm. just like simple errors, right, that they could make. Um, Washington, Wisconsin, right? Like, like these things, they, they, all of a sudden now you got people advertising, you're blowing money and you're not managing your marketers. So like the last thing is like, you can't really see it outwardly, but it's the, sy- the symptom disease thing. Mm-hmm. Like meet with your marketer once a week and focus on KPIs and optimization. Like what are we doing right now to make this better? Because marketers get to set it and forget it thing, right? Like they just, they got 30 accounts. They can't give everybody an hour of their time every week because they also have to do their job. So they wait for the squeaky wheel and you just have to set the relationship terms early. And it's like, look, you're charging three grand a month. I want to make sure I'm meeting with you once a week for 30 minutes. How much now? 35 done because that $500 will save you 50,000. So what, what's, um, how, how do you, for the person who's just trying to run their contracting business, they just want the phone to ring. They want to sell shit, right. And produce stuff Mm -hmm. and blah, blah, blah. And they're, they don't roll out of bed like you think in marketing <laughs> mm-hmm. and uh and data how uh what do you tell that person like how do you know you have the the right or wrong marketing agency company what are some indicators Ooh. i mean yeah i mean if you're if you're not getting out of bed and thinking marketing i'm thinking like you're talking like one two million dollar contractors like guys three three mm-hmm. employees or, or less kind of thing yeah mm-hmm. right like you're like three office employees or less and they probably have more workers right? Then, you know, it's true. You're probably not thinking about marketing because like, the guy who's 5'10", that's probably all he's thinking about, right? Mm-hmm. But the, um, but those guys, right? You just want the phone to ring. We have to think in terms of you have to look as if you're a $10 million company. So you have to do a few things right. Google My Business has to be done right. So you got to have someone who can help you with that. And you got to pay for it to be done right once. You don't have to continue to pay mm-hmm. for that forever. Like, If that's a checkbox is like the also thing. It's like, no, pay for that to get done right. Then sign with an agency for a retainer. Your website does not have to have 73 pages. You don't need $20,000 a month in blogs, right? Your website has to look like you didn't make it, right? It's got to look like a good, you know, spend (laughs) 10 grand, right? Yeah. And get a decent website. It doesn't have to be constantly updated, but when people look at you, they got to think they've, they showed up and made it made to look serious. Right. Mm -hmm. And then from there, right. You know, you're not probably going to win on a lot of search engine pay-per-click type stuff. I would really be focused on direct mail, right? I would really just be focused on direct mail or canvassing, you know, but direct mail, it's super effective for small guys. Mm -hmm. It's cheap. You spray and pray, and then you just have to focus on your offer. So just do direct mail, find your ideal customer avatar, target those neighborhoods, and you know hit direct mail up because it's, you can control your costs and you can run tests but you know you're going to test with like 3000 postcards right you got to think yeah. that's what we're going to test with but you know you can create a very clear offer and get really good real business intelligence back and then just be consistent just be consistent with it like don't market when you don't have customers market when you have customers and the last thing is like you're not you're, again you're not going to out there's guys who are spe- out spending your what you make a year in marketing so right. you're not going to win on that. So you have to treat it, your business and your customer, like you're not ever going to get to advertise because the advertising you're doing isn't that effective anyway. So you treat your customers like fucking gold and just yeah. focus on referrals because if you can get a referral, a referral from every single job and mm-hmm. a Google review from every single job, like if you just treat it like you could, marketing was now banned. You know what I mean? Like it was considered yeah. a poison to society and it was banned. What would you do? You mm-hmm. damn sure make sure every customer told you told their friends, right? So that that's an interesting thing you bring up because <clears throat> I talk a lot about I've done trainings and talks and videos and episodes on you got to market your business, you got to build your brand, you know, and that can look like a lot of different things. There's shit you have control over that you can do. There's things you could pay for and everything in between. And every now and then you get that guy who weighs in on the comment, you know, he's like. I've been in business 43 years and, 
and all my work is word of mouth and it's and, but he's still a one man show making 63,000 bucks a year and he's still got the tools on when he's 64 years old right so yeah. it's and so that cuz you can't control what they say what who they right. say it to when they say it like if they're saying oh yeah I talked to this guy he was the cheapest that's terrible marketing yeah so like I guess what's like every one of us 100% wants the word of mouth referral lead to come in but again, not always controllable. And mm -hmm. so what's that balance that you would tell somebody? Cause we both acknowledge like, of course you want the word of mouth, mm -hmm. right? But you gotta, if you have any ambitions of scaling your business and your team oh, and getting well, the tools yeah, off, you're going to about... have to spend some fucking money. So what's, yeah. The, so now you're going to have to how chart do you work that line, right? Yeah. So I say that the next thing you do, right is then you have to go to a target rich environment, right? If you want to make a hot dog stand, make a lot of money, what's the one, number one most important thing? It's not the hot dog, right? It's, it's hungry not, people. It's hungry people, right? Yeah. We've all heard that. So it's hungry people. Where do you find a starving crowd? Home shows. So you start by spending a big chunk of money at a home show and you make your home show booth the most fun booth in the whole thing. You appeal to kids, right? Mm -hmm. So have like the Las Vegas or the circus, the carnival, right? Some, some kind of theme to your booth yet, you know, get your logo, use chat GPT, make your logo look like it's something on the Vegas sign. You get, you rent some stuff to make some games, you know, one of those like spinny roulette games or something or poker. Mm -hmm. and you, you give away card decks with your logo on them and you, and you make it super fun for kids. You have cotton candy and you make it the most fun booth at that show and just be memorable. Just be mm -hmm. memorable at the home show for the starving crowd that's coming to look for your service. Don't talk about your products and your, you know, how great you are because that's what everybody's saying. Yeah. Just be memorable and give people a good experience at the home show. That allows you to spend a good chunk of money to a starving crowd that you get to try and become memorable, and you're gonna mm -hmm. and just gather leads and phone people and try and follow up on those leads. Then. You do that once or two times, combined with some stuff like direct mail, and yeah, you got BNI groups, but that's high effort and low output and all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, right? But then that should get you a bit of cash flow, right? And then once you have cash flow, then you have to say, okay, now I'm going to invest in marketing, and now is where you have to say, I'm going to commit to spending five percent of my target revenue, and it's realistic that I could grow twenty percent, thirty percent, fifty percent. So if I'm making two million a year, and I want to make you know, grow 50%. I want to do three. Well, then I'm going to have to say, I want to spend 5% of three million. I'm going to spend $150,000 this year on marketing. And then you work the community and you look for, again, how would you hire a contractor? You look for referrals, word of mouth, recommendations, just mm -hmm. same damn thing. Hiring a services contractor in the marketing world. And you say, who is going to help me spend my $150,000 the best? And you ramp it. So you start at maybe it's 150 over 12 months is what? Like that's going to be uh uh, oh gosh, what 12, five a month, a month or something. 12 yeah, something months, like 12, so five a month. Yeah. So now you're going to start with six and then go seven, then go nine, then go 12, right? And you're going to ramp up, right? But you, you, and you base it on results and you have to, again, work mm. with your agency weekly after you find something recommendable and, you know, don't focus on the hoity toity stuff, like long-term things like SEO. That's mm. when you want to build a moat around your business, right? SEO is a good long-term play and you should be investing in it. But at first, you need cash flow. So you're doing lead generation efforts, right? Off, Take your offers that worked in direct mail. Conveniently, postcards are shaped like Facebook ads. So just yeah. run those as ads, right? <laughs> and then pay-per-click, Google guaranteed, mm -hmm. right? Get yep. it or get it. Or you can go with lead aggregators, right? Like the Angie's lists and the thumbtacks. And yeah, they're ripping you off and taking your money. And, you know, they're, it's competitive. So you got to have fast response times. Mm -hmm. So then if you're going that route, you got to invest in systems to make your calling people back in 3.5 minutes, right? So yeah. when you look to scale, you have to kind of go from consistency to windfall to consistency. Mm -hmm. And it helps if you have a little bit of luck and you spend invest a little bit of time going from I'm waking up not thinking about marketing every day to I'm waking up and I'm thinking about marketing every day. Like you have to eventually yeah. make that switch because 40, 50 million dollar guys, that's all they talk about. Right. right. I want right. 300 dollars leads that close at 30 percent at a 40 percent gross profit. And I'll spend yeah. to infinity if I find that. Hmm. So <clears throat> I got two more questions. One's piggyback on the marketing thing and the other 
I'll plant the seed for you now is you've got an audience of several thousand contractors here. Um, I'm just going to ask you, what do you want to close out with for them? Okay. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the last question. So, um, roofing, solar, pet, uh, not pet, uh, pest control. Mm -hmm. Those types of things are known for their canvassing and door knocking and stuff like that, where other trades are not. Mm -hmm. Um, when I, uh, at one of my painting companies at one point, I think I had four or five college guys out there in the summer canvassing and over two summers, I think we got one job. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and so, because I, I think, um, I'm obviously biased, but I, to me, it's interruptive, you know, it's, it's a very interrupted market, interruptive marketing tactic mm -hmm. that, um, uh, is not tied to something like roofing where insurance is in play and energy bills and some things like that. Right. So, and, and I'm mm -hmm. not an expert at all in that. I, I actually door knocked one day for an alarm company when I got out of the Marine Corps and I said, fuck this, I am not doing <laughs> that. So, um, so I'm just curious, like, do you, um, when I think of roofing companies, I mm -hmm. think of, um, you know, I got a buddy, he's got a $75 million company, you know, he's, um, highly tied in with the insurance world and things like that. Are there roofing companies that are crushing it that are not playing the insurance game and are they doing the canvassing, having the same luck? I'm just curious what that. Yeah. So, yeah. Some are right. There's and, some and, if are... You, and if you move to a new city tomorrow, and started mm -hmm. a roofing company, would you would you go the insurance game and all that? Or if I had so? if I had no money, probably. Yeah. Like, one thing about roofing that people don't get is that they're spoiled, right? Like you're like there's not many industries in this world where you can. I mean, you want to open a yogurt shop, you're buying desks or like tables, chairs, bathroom, yeah. handicap bar. You got to pay painting, signs, freezers, the spinny thing on the wall, point of sale system, sixteen year olds. You got to have licensing and permits and occupancy and food inspections. Yep. And then you got to get a parking lot and you got to pay for a lease the whole time. And after you spend $200,000, Susie and her kids walk in and spend 38 bucks, right? <laughs> Roofing, if you can get a ladder stuffed into your vehicle and you can park it a block up the road, go knock on some doors, find somebody who will trust you, get them to sign a contingency, you just do retail, get them to agree to get a roof from you. You can get the material, you can get a $5,000 cash account at any roofing supply house. The subs get paid two weeks later. You can make 40% gross profit on $15,000 in 36 hours. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if I was going to a new market, like, yeah. I, I mean, I don't know if I do insurance right away because I don't have the capital to float the jobs and wait for insurance right. to pay me. You might get, like, homeowners to pay. Like, you usually get an immediate first check. But, you know, mm -hmm. if you don't know the insurance game... Like mm -hmm. that's a quick way to get your ass handed to you, right? Yeah. But you and you can sell anything door to door if you're good at selling door to door. Because the tool doesn't matter as much as the process, and the process doesn't matter as much as adoption. But like, I mean, there's door to door coaches that go around selling no soliciting signs to prove a point. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I mean, they, they they there's there's so there's you can like they go and sell stuff, but again. It matters how good you are at it. And they, most people, I bet when you went and sold door to door, they probably gave you three minutes of training. Here's a contract yeah. going up door, see if people will sign it. Like you gotta be trained, but you're right. It is interruptive and it's not my favorite marketing method. However, it's the freest marketing method there is. But I also think that roofing has it, it, a bit of an advantage in that, yeah, if you got the capital to fold the jobs and you got an insurance market, there's a huge need that you can see from the street. Solar, you can kind of mm -hmm. see it from the street. I don't know how pest control does it, but I think they go on volume. Right. But there's mm -hmm. and like you see more, right? Can't political canvassers. So there's an entire yeah. canvassing industry and yeah. those people know how to do their job. Right. Like a right. storm season for canvassers because of all the political polling. But I think that could you I mean, there's college pro painters. I think they do door mm -hmm. knock, but yeah. um, it's not it's exterior painting, probably more so than mm -hmm. interior. But yep. if you're it, it is a way it is a way to make money. It's a hard way to make money. You're going to get a lot of people kicking doors in your face. You're going to knock a hundred doors to get one to open. And that's when the game starts. So right, right. it's not, it's like, it's not for the feeble, feeble for sure. And most people don't give good training. So people who would otherwise probably be good at it, don't get a chance to be good at it because no one gives them like the rundown where it's like, mm -hmm. Hey, you're going to knock a hundred doors today. 
every single person's gonna be mean to you. Like, cause I did, I do I knocked doors and yeah. sold vacuum cleaners. Like, you know what I mean? Like I told him it was a $2,800 air, uh, air purifier at first, right? Oh and then God. you give him a free knife set. And then sometimes <laughs> they chase you out with the free knife set. It was a terrible way to make money. Right. But yeah. it's just, it's just a, again, it's like anything it's, it's how good are you at it? And I just, I agree with you though. Like if someone knocks on my door right now, I'm like, Whoa, man, like I'm, I'm going to come up there and be a dick. So I'm gonna be like, man, I was on a good podcast. I was doing really good. Me and Tom yeah. were having a great time. I wasn't sure what it was. And now you're trying to sell me an alarm system. Like get out of here. Right. Yeah. And that guy's yeah. going to go home and be like, I can't do this job. Mm-hmm. Right. And why? Because yeah. I'm pissed off. Like, so it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. Um, and, a lot, and, 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 but a lot of people, that's the only way they know how to make money is go, they say, you know what? I got two feet in a heartbeat and I got a guy willing to pay me 10% of a $15,000 contract if I can get these people to do it. And then mm-hmm. there's not, and they have the, they have the juice to do it. Other yeah. people, you know, they couldn't do it to save their lives. But if you give them a warm lead, they'll go in, present the value and excessive price and walk out with a signed contract. And you can find more people like that. So you as a CEO, it's your job to try and find your best approach to the market. And if you can't, if you haven't done door knocking, if you can't teach it, guess what? You got to find a way to get warm leads to your people and teach them how to present on value. Bam. Yeah, it's, uh, I used to have, uh, I'm just I'm reminiscing right now. I had those college guys that knocked for us. And then I would have my kids at the time. I'd take them out on a Saturday morning. I'd drive in my company truck and I'd have my two boys and my daughter, three of them, uh, on you know each side of the road. And they'd have our door hangers and they would go knock on doors and hang it on there because nobody was mean to a little kid. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. But we did it on a Saturday morning because a lot of people were out doing yard work and stuff like that. So they would see us coming and and dude, it's funny. My, my kids got me more projects than my, my four or five college guys I had knocking doors. It's kind of funny. Oh yeah. Well, so I mean, they know. could, they could sell you on buying a chocolate bar when you didn't want to buy a chocolate yeah. bar. So don't count them out. <laughs> well, my, my, my daughter was about, uh, right around a year old. I had this customer. She was totally pissed at our crew for something. She called me. She's like, you need to get right over here and and basically you're an asshole and I hate you. And you know, that was the the vibe of the conversation. Right. And I made a detour. I swung home and picked up my daughter and she was a year old and, and she's adopted from China. She's got the two little pigtails and she's in my arms and I knock on the door. This lady opens the door all mad. She sees my daughter. She goes, Oh my God, you're the most precious thing in the world. Can I hold her? And problem solved. <laughs> problem solved. <laughs> so I, Every... I have used my children several times through the years uh, to, well, to get out of sticky situations. Pretty, <laughs> they have a pretty good dad, and I'm pretty sure they got pretty well set up. Yeah, so that's and, good and for them. So I was just trying to coach you up there and how to use Atlas in the future. Uh, you know what? I'm definitely older, man. I gotta get them. I gotta get them on content. <laughs> people love dad version of Adam. It's actually really funny because people are like, "This is a, like, I, the whole joke went out around the week when he was born. This is like this 100 percent irrefutable truth that Adam is not actually a robot." Yeah, <laughs> they change him, man. That's for sure. So, um, in addition to where can people find you and and what can you do for them? What uh, what do you want to close us out with? Something that they might be on your mind that we haven't talked about or something you want to reiterate what do you got you know you actually are a fantastic interviewer right this is the second time you do a great job like <laughs> I, there's you. really nothing that i would want to add like i really got to meander through a lot of like really good thoughts and i think that i mean if people could just do what we talked about i think that again the contracting space in america as a country would be better mm-hmm. um but you know like we you know my business right we just we focus on being a consulting company that deploys the operating frameworks that we know work in the roofing industry. And then we build technology as infrastructure to support that, to make sure it's measurable and it can, and it's consistent. Um, and you know, if they want to hear more about us, like we try to be everywhere. So we have a YouTube yep. channel, right? We have our website, we do webinars and, and I regularly go to conferences and at the end of the day, I, I love connecting and talking to people. So, you know, you can always hit me up on my personal Facebook at Adam Sat Cause at the end of the day, I, I, my friends are few, my relationships in the industry are, are, are many, and I like to I like to treat that those relationships really well because, I, again, there's a mission behind what I'm doing that makes every connection worthwhile. So I'm happy mm-hmm. to connect with anybody anywhere, whether they're paying me or not. I just want to 
again, I want to contribute, right? Yep. Absolutely. What's your website? Uh, roofingbusinesspartner.com. There you go. Keep it simple. Boom. Yep. Very simple. Awesome. Well, we'll make sure to drop that in the show notes and all that stuff, dude. It was, uh, it was good catching up again. It's been a few, probably four or five years, I think. And like you yeah. said be, before you, it was kind of a different conversation. It was all geared around Facebook ads and some of mm -hmm. that stuff, which, uh, uh, I know we didn't get into, but bottom line here is, you know, I appreciate you sharing, uh, you know, some of your wisdom, like I said, I think before we hit record, I, I view you kind of as a mad scientist with things, which is a compliment. Like it's, thank you. Um, you're one of the first people I think of when I think like, I need somebody who knows how to, how to fucking get data that matters. Like that's Thank just you. the brand you have built for me on the outside looking in. That's one of the things like I've, cause I've watched the journey through several years where you've kind of, um, you've kind of become a beast in that space, man. It's pretty cool to watch. So. Well, I appreciate it. It's hard, tip, hard work, yeah. hard earned. Yeah. I appreciate the opportunity to connect. And, and of course, if there's anything that was of value to this, I, I hope that uh, it helps the show and, and it helps the people listening. And if they reach out to me, I'd, I'd love to talk. You got it, man. We'll, we'll make sure to put all the stuff in the show notes and guys, give us a rating, give us a review and Adam Sand. Thanks for being on the show today, man. Appreciate you. You bet.